Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. I'm speaking to other states or speaking to other countries. How the state's Netflix model for Hep C could work for other meds. It seems like an extreme measure to incarcerate somebody simply because they did not come to court with a private defense attorney. Court Watch Nola speaking out against defendants being held in contempt of court for not hiring a private attorney. We're offering swim lessons to people who oftentimes would be forgotten about. Helping inner city kids learn to swim. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, a look at other headlines making news across our state. An internet security breach led Governor John Bell Edwards to issue an emergency declaration. This after malware attacks were detected against three school systems in the state. The governor did not offer details about the attacks, except to say they affected school systems in Sabine and Morehouse parishes and in the city of Monroe. The declaration makes state resources available to help local governments respond to the cyber attacks and stop future data loss. The level of the Mississippi River dropped enough so that the Army Corps of Engineers this week began closing bays at the Bonnie Carey Spillway. As they start closing bays, they will continue to monitor the river. The spillway was created to limit the river's rush past New Orleans. It's been open for more than 75 days. Two Gretna police officers were fired Monday, one for a Facebook post calling U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a vile idiot and suggesting that she be shot. The other lost his job for liking the post. Gretna's police chief, Arthur Lawson, announced the terminations Monday. Officer Charlie Raspoli was fired for a post saying Ocasio-Cortez needs a round and not the kind she used to serve, an apparent reference to her once being a bartender. GOP candidate for governor, Eddie Rasponi, finally got his first TV spot on the air, while infighting among the two GOP candidates continues. A political action committee says U.S. Representative Ralph Abraham is not following requests to avoid verbal attacks. The group, Securing Louisiana's Future PAC, which is supporting Abraham, released a Facebook ad panning Rasponi, saying the wealthy Baton Rouge businessman is trying to buy his election, but he can't win. The two Republicans are trying to keep incumbent John Bell Edwards from a second term as the Deep South's only governor who is a Democrat. Former Southern Band director Nathan Hamer is accused of pocketing more than $293,000 from public funds owed to the school. This from a report released by legislative auditor Daryl Perpera. The report says Hamer set up a collection system with a third party to snag the money. A lawsuit is calling the maps used to elect the state's seven Supreme Court justices discriminatory against African American voters. The lawsuit, filed in Baton Rouge U.S. District Court, seeks a declaration that the districts violate the Federal Voting Rights Act. A chicken producer is planning a $47 million expansion of its operations in Louisiana, creating a new feed mill and upgrades to its hatchery and processing plant. The North Louisiana expansions of House of Rayford Farms should create almost 120 jobs. The North Carolina-based company says it's spending $41 million to improve a feed mill in Lincoln Parish and $6 million on improvements in Bienville Parish. A popular downtown Shreveport Cafe located at 1234 Louisiana Avenue is under new ownership, but the new bosses say expect Jacqueline's to be the same. And don't worry, the shrimp salad sandwich isn't going anywhere, they say. 
After 35 years in the restaurant business, founders Jacqueline and Jimmy Caskey have retired, but the down-home charm that helped their place a go-to spot will remain. At Living Faith Christian Center Monday, a near full house attended memorial services honoring the life of Sadie Roberts Joseph. A July 12th murder ended her life on earth. It was news that stunned everyone who heard about it. Miss Sadie is being remembered as an educator, gifted storyteller, civic leader, matriarch, preservationist, and founder of the Baton Rouge African American Museum. Governor Edwards and Baton Rouge Mayor Sharon Weston Broom were among the speakers at the services. Miss Sadie was 75 years old. Locked up because you couldn't afford to get your own attorney. That's what a number of people say happened to them in Orleans Parish. And the watchdog group Court Watch NOLA says they have the documentation to prove it. They say it's illegal and it has to stop. Simone Levine says her watchdog group Court Watch NOLA has monitored the Orleans Parish court system closely since being founded in 2007. So our reports normally uh, look into victim rights, for example, constitutional rights problems and issues of procedural fa fairness. We also look at issues involving financial improprieties of those that are in the court system. The 2018 report detailed what dozens of court watchers found in Orleans District, magistrate and municipal courts. And Levine says a lot of what was documented was unconstitutional and illegal. One issue they say they've seen before has apparently found its way back into Orleans Parish courtrooms. What we had looked at with this report is we had looked at um, def we had looked at criminal defendants, so people who are arrested, mm -hmm. who are being forced to hire a private defense attorney, mm -hmm. despite the fact that they may or may not be able to afford one. I think that judges have pressure to move their docket. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, think that also there is a problem when it comes to the public defender system here in Louisiana. She says there simply aren't enough public defenders, a well-documented issue throughout the state, but defendants should not be punished because of it. You know, I think that oftentimes judges make this quick decision that a criminal defendant is going to need to hire a private defense attorney, and we have seen that they don't make the necessary inquiry. And so oftentimes what we have seen is a judge who will require a defendant to hire a private defense attorney simply because they have been able to make bail. And we know that in Louisiana that that's completely against the laws. It seems like an extreme measure to incarcerate somebody simply because they did not come to court with a private defense attorney. Levine says the law is very clear. It seems several judges in Orleans Parish, though, are ignoring the defendant's rights. Specifically, the law says that a determination where a defendant is required to hire a private defense attorney should not be based solely on the fact that they have been able to pay bail. And she says there are clear reasons why making bail should not be the only factor used to determine one's ability to secure a private attorney. And it makes sense. Mm -hmm. If I have a rich uncle that bails me out of jail and then wants to have nothing to do with me, I still can't afford a private defense attorney. She says it's very important to shed light on this very serious issue. And the great news is, is that we've reported on this issue before and we've seen the numbers go down. Mm -hmm. So we've seen the numbers of judges who require a private defense attorney simply because the defendant has made bail. We've seen those numbers go down. So we know that judges are doing a better job in Orleans Parish. They're doing a better job, but she says some judges are continuing to punish defendants and even locking them up unjustly. What we looked at this time round is uh, the phenomena where a judge can hold someone in contempt if they fail to hire a private defense attorney. And we found two judges who did it. And we know that we've only found the minimum. So there probably are more judges that have done it. One of the judges we found held a criminal defendant in contempt and required them to do a large amount of community service because they did not bring a private defense attorney to court. She says what is unclear in nearly every instance is if the proper investigation was conducted on each defendant to clarify if they really could afford to pay for an attorney. And in one specific case, she says, the judge seemed to get impatient and because of it, the defendant was sent to jail for several days. The defendant didn't have enough information to give him and then he held him in contempt. And when he, hired, when he held him in contempt, what he did was he held him in contempt for nine 
days, mm -hmm. and he didn't set a bail amount. So if I'm if I'm incarcerated for nine days without bail, that means I have. It, it doesn't matter if I have all the money in the world, I cannot get out. There's no bail that will get me out. It sounds like the judge uh, may have changed his or her or changed his mind midway through and then set bail. Mm -hmm. And then that defendant served four days mm -hmm. in jail just simply because the judge thought that he needed to hire a private defense attorney. Levine says there was another important point that was apparently ignored when the defendant came back to court. When this judge determined mm -hmm. that he was going to hold him in contempt, mm -hmm. you know, that there's a there's a high standard that has to be met mm -hmm. in order to for someone to be held in contempt. Mm -hmm. And this defendant didn't have an attorney mm -hmm. to defend him. So didn't have an attorney to be able to say, look, judge, this didn't meet the high standard of contempt. The bottom line, she says, is those affected by this the most are those who really can't afford to fight. 85% of the criminal defendant community in Orleans Parish in 2018 were, um, had to, was, were forced to hire uh, the public defender's office. So 85% were close to the poverty line. Now, we reached out to two of the judges named in the Court Watch NOLA report for comment, but they did not return our calls. Coming up next month on SWI, we talk with members of the overburdened Public Defender's Office who fought a lawsuit against the state of Louisiana and Governor John Bell Edwards because of what they say is broken funding. Now, they say they are scheduled to go to court in September. It's been an extra busy week for Health Secretary Dr. Rebecca Gee, just back from a conference at the Brookings Institute where, yes, she talked about the state's new model for treating hepatitis C. That model is suddenly the rage, with other states and other countries wanting in on what Louisiana knows. Since the hep C model was rolled out in Louisiana, there's been so much talk about why it works. So why was it the right time for Louisiana to use this? Right, well, hep C is a crisis in our country. It's the leading infectious disease killer of our time, killing more people than all 60 infectious diseases below it combined. So it's the leading killer, but it's the only virus we have a cure for. We don't have a cure for AIDS or HIV. We don't have a cure for the common cold. This we have a cure for, one of the greatest medical discoveries of our time, but it was out of reach. We have 90,000 people with this condition in Louisiana. And in Medicaid, we don't been able to treat only about 3% of the people with this condition because the drug cost initially over $80,000. So huge price tag, uh, no way to pay for it in, in, a way, in, in the way we wanted to, which was to cure everyone who had it. And so we asked the question uh, and it took us three years to get to the final answer, which was yes, could we do this a different way? Because it was so expensive, I mean, it, the drug went from 90 ish thousand dollars down to tens of thousands of dollars. We couldn't afford to treat everyone with the sure. virus. So to get this drug, you would have to show that you had end organ damage, you know, liver disease or cancer. You weren't able to get it just because you had infection or were a little bit sick. You kind of had to be a lot sick. And so this is a totally new model, just cure everyone who has it. And we're able to do it for at or about what we spent last year in our budget, but for that getting unlimited access. And it's nice for Louisiana to be the first state in the nation to do this type of model. So it's, a, it's been really exciting for us to be able to not just have this idea, but see it come to fruition sure. and see people's lives being changed. And give hope and encouragement and Louisiana first. That's right. That's kind of a nice thing to say, huh? Right. This is something that now everyone is like, oh, okay, so tell us about it. So you're speaking to other states, yeah, uh, this might work for them. I'm speaking to other states or speaking to other countries. You know, there been reached out to by uh, UK people in England looking at this for vaccines, people looking at this for um, addiction treatment. Certainly, Australia had done something similar to this. So it's not, of course, the idea of a subscription is not new. Mm -hmm. We know what Netflix is. We know what subscriptions are, but applying it to a Medicaid program is what was so unique. My question now is. Is there the opportunity for this to expand to the myriad of other medications that exist, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's or uh, diabetes or, or, or so many? Could this model work for those? Is that something that you're looking at? Yes. Yes. Our goal is to cure an hepatitis C and end the epidemic in our state. So that's a lot 
of work that we have over the next five years, and that's a term of this. Um, so we're focused on this first, but certainly we look at the addiction um, issues that we have. We have an opioid epidemic. People need treatment. They either need Narcan, which is the anecdote to overdose, or they need Suboxone or Vivitrol, which are drugs that help you deal with an addiction on an ongoing basis. Those are expensive. So certainly those types of things would be a great um, fit for this model. And our model also includes individuals who are incarcerated. Why? Because 95% of people who have this disease who are incarcerated will re-enter communities. We want them to re-enter healthy, able to work, but also reduce their long-term costs. If we can treat them while they're in a correctional facility, then when they get into Medicaid or into Medicare or a publicly funded program, we're not paying full freight for that drug. In theory, over time, if you develop a cure to anything, you eliminate it, right? right. So, so, so the fact that we have a five-year level uh, subscription to that medication allows them to make to their investors to say oh we have secured revenue so that's not a bad thing for the company so we we discovered a win-win now where else could you have a win-win anything that cures childhood cancers you know as we learn more about the human genome we become much more sophisticated at treating certain types of cancers so a subscription might be a good way to deal with that saying listen company you want to innovate and provide drugs for childhood cancer um, we, we applaud that. We could have a national innovation fund that, that, that helps support that research, but also subscriptions that states say, listen, we'll, we'll support you, but we can't spend 200 million on your drug, but we can spend 10 or 20. And so the companies would get guaranteed revenue. So I think for childhood cancers or, or um, targeted um, gene therapies, this could be helpful. It could be helpful for um, rheumatoid arthritis. It could be helpful for any area where you have comp competition and limited funds. Um, we figured out all of the kinks here, and so now we've done it, and we have the, the um, playbook for you. But you've got to find the willing pharmaceutical partner. And so I think this is one model, but I also think that we need, um, and the Trump administration is pursuing this, significant reforms in how we price pharmaceuticals. So this is one of, I think, an array of solutions that need to be pursued. This model and what could come next will remain big news in medical care. Our thanks to Dr. Gee for that interview. Baton Rouge police Thursday arrested a 16-year-old in the shooting death of an 18-year-old. The body apparently dumped in a city park last month. The murder took place in June. It was a month that was especially violent, mostly shootings on the crime blotter. One night at one night club, seven people were injured. This month, Louisiana Public Square brought together parents, students, and law enforcement to explore how to combat the challenges of youth and guns. Sometimes these young kids feel they need a weapon to protect themselves, and maybe themselves are not in any gang or group that would cause them any need, but they feel that they need that. That's a tough conversation to have. And so what do you do when you find your child who's under 21 that has a gun? Who do you call? Who do you give the gun to? How do you confront that child? How do you secure, secure that weapon? Uh, difficult conversations to have, but it surely has to happen, I believe, in everyone's house. And it has to also be surrounded by that neighborhood, by that community. Everybody has to have each other's back. And I think that's where we're kind of lacking at this point right now. And it has to start individually in the house. I think if you start any type of kind of mentoring um, program in your school where maybe upperclassmen um, would have like a little mentee or something mm -hmm. for a younger or some type of partnership where if someone is going through something they know this is a group of individuals that we trust enough that we can say something to with the understanding that you will have a good relationship with administration to be able to report something because what we what we've noticed so much is that a lot of what we see and a lot of violence in our community is communicated through social media and kids see it all the time what are you doing with your studio that can um, change this narrative that can have a, um, a young black man walk into your studio and say, hey, I don't want to be the next rapper that's dead on the street. I want to be a rapper that makes a song that can actually bring life to the community. Well, first, <clears throat> for the last year, I've drawn lines. No cursing, no talking about drugs, guns, no violence. And we do that because we mold and shape and tell them, I want to see what else you have. It's more in you. And a lot of times we only could operate off of what we know and what we've been fed. You know, you, you hear the saying, you are what you eat. 
and a lot of times in our community, urban community, our culture is is hip hop. It's cool. It's it's you know it's swag and and it's not talking about the things that need to be spoken on. So I give <clears throat> that environment to where you can speak what needs to be said. The word of God is the truth. So we're gonna give them the word of God in music. So I actually started my career in Crime Stoppers, answering the phones as a police cadet, mm -hmm. uh, taking tips, running them down the hall to the detectives, and 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 watching the fruit, you know, the fruits of, of the information that the public gave result in the clearance of a, of a crime. And it's kind of what got me addicted to police work. And, uh, and so it works. I I'm, can definitely tell you it works. And 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 you are going to remain anonymous. So you can see something online and call Crime Stoppers and report it. And there'll be some follow up. Yep. And if there's a cash reward available, you could get it. Yep. Youth and Guns re-airs this Sunday at 11 a.m. For more information, visit lpb.org slash public square. Tragedy at a place known for fun in Shreveport, the corner in Caddo Parish today, confirming a 13-year-old boy drowned at Splash Kingdom Water Park. He reportedly went under at about 5 p.m. yesterday and never came up. Will Lurker reports because drowning is the number one cause of unintentional death for children in the U.S. The move to teach kids how to swim is stronger than ever. Though all children look forward to cooling off from a hot summer day with a splash in a pool, many will dive in without first even having the most basic knowledge of how to swim. Many of these eager yet inexperienced children reside in North Baton Rouge. Inner city children who often don't have access to uh, swimming pools are five and a half times more likely to drown than someone who is not living inner city. Rob Dowie, owner of Louisiana-based Sela Aquatics, saw this reality driven home while volunteering in the days following Hurricane Katrina. I ended up volunteering at a shelter in Baton Rouge, uh, and one of the kids who I had taught the free swim lessons to uh, ran up to me and said, Mr. Rob, Mr. Rob, I swam, I swam, Mr. Rob, I swam. And upon talking to him a little bit more, I, I recognized that uh, this particular uh, child swam out of their house as it was flooding uh, and it saved his life. We asked that particular uh, child, you know, where are your parents? And his answer was, well, no one taught my parents how to swim. And from that moment, my whole perspective on water safety changed. By the 1940s, African Americans made up a third of Baton Rouge's population, but opportunities to swim were limited. Segregation kept blacks out of white-only pools, and they missed out on valuable lessons. This did not change until the formation of Breck in 1946 and the construction of City Brooks, the first pool for African Americans, which opened three years later in 1949. Breck, you know, it has a long history, which all started around pools, even with the, the social equity problem that they had growing up in the 60s uh, with the different pools, I mean, even City Brooks. Um, and building that pool out there, giving everybody the same opportunity. The scariest part for me was jumping in the deep end. It was 10 feet and I had to learn how to swim in 10 feet. And again, I was only seven years old. Using Louisiana tax dollars, children from all over the state were learning to swim. There was a grant where every second grader uh, in the Orleans Parish Public School got free swim lessons as part of their PE curriculum. And so as a senior in high school, I participated as a volunteer instructor for that program. Though desegregation helped play a part in reducing the number of drownings each year, the problem still continued. Within the last 10 years, all three of Breck swimming pools have been reduced both in size and depth to reduce drownings. Well, I don't think everybody's given the same opportunity. Um, with Breck, we, we provide social quality, especially with the social equity mission statement that we have. Uh, we wanted to follow that and give everybody the same thing. Um, big life-threatening thing right now for children that are ages, you know, three to 15 is drowning. And we partner with the Red Cross and SELA again, uh, just to make people water aware. Uh, and to save lives, especially because our location is prone to hurricanes and flooding. Through the partnership with the three companies, instructors are trained through the American Red Cross on how to most effectively teach lessons to children with an underlying fear of water. Let's take a qualified Red Cross instructor trainer, uh, bring them to the table, 
and uh, you deliver that content that the Red Cross has created uh, and you take people who are good communicators, you take people who want to do the right thing, you take hardworking individuals and you can deliver that content to them and like, like that. Uh, you have a qualified swim instructor. The free lessons help both Breck and Sela accomplish their goals, to provide life-saving skills to children of all backgrounds. We're offering swim lessons to people who oftentimes would be forgotten about. Now we're not, we're not forgetting about them. We're offering them free swim lessons. And uh, our ultimate goal, whether that means Sela Aquatics or Breck or the American Red Cross, is to bring both of those stats down. We don't want it to be the number one cause of unintentional death. We don't want uh, inner city children to be five and a half times more likely to drown than someone who's not living in an inner city. Though the skills being taught at the lessons are basic, they are fundamental to a child's survival, and the fun and educational memories will resonate with them for the rest of their lives. Reporting for LPB, I'm Will Lurker. Now, Breck, Sela Aquatics, and the American Red Cross have partnered to offer these free swim lessons to kids in Baton Rouge, ages 5 to 12. Well, the city of New Orleans suffered the loss of another musical legend this week with the death of Art Neville. Neville was the oldest of the Neville brothers who founded that group along with the Meters. He passed away peacefully at his New Orleans home Monday with his wife by his side. In his five decade long career, he won three Grammys, including a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018. Art Neville was 81 years old. And that is our show for this week, everyone. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are with our brand new app. Download it for free from your app store. This upgraded version features news, public affairs, documentaries, and how-tos, plus many more programs. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Boro. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.